Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today's, um, in today's webinar. My name is Viviana Valencia and I'm the Executive Coordinator at Caldo. For those of you who have participated in previous webinars, uh, we'll continue with the series of studying in Canada. In this series, uh, we have invited our 10 member universities to uh, provide information in terms of the requirements for, for graduate programs. Before we start, um, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce to you um, Caldo, uh, the Caldo Consortium and its services, and also provide you a bit of information in terms of housekeeping items. So at the end of the session, uh, we're gonna have uh, some, some time for, for questions and answers. If you would like to post a question, please use the Q&A box, uh, will normally appear at the bottom of your screen. You may um, write the question there, please do it in English, so our presenter can answer the questions after his presentation. Also, please note that this webinar is being recorded and we will provide you with a recording after, after, the, after the session. Um, in the event that you would like to view it again, or if in case you miss some information, you can then have it uh, with you and can go back to it later. Okay, well, with this, um, I would like to introduce you to Caldo, as I had mentioned before. So Caldo is a consortium composed of 10 of Canada's U15 leading universities, distinguished from other Canadian universities because of their strong research focus. Our members consist of the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, Dalhousie University, Université Laval, McMaster University, the University of Ottawa, the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Toronto, the University of Waterloo, and Western University. So what do we do at Caldo? Uh, Caldo see it as a bridge between you, the student, and the university. So what we do is uh, we provide a, a wide array of free services to prospective students to connect with our member universities. For example, some of the uh, services that we offer are assistance with the steps to apply for graduate programs at any of our member universities, information in terms of requirements for our programs, information as well in terms of uh, funding agencies from the countries that we work with, like uh, scholarships that you might be able to access. Um, also, if you visit our website, we provide um, a, what I call is like a search engine tool where you can type, uh, let's say if you're interested on in doing a master's in communication studies, then you type the, the field that you're interested, the level, if it's a master or PhD, and then you can find all of the programs available within our 10 member universities. So basically, instead of going to each, uh, the page of each of our members, you can just go to Caldo, type uh, the, the, the information that you're seeking, and then you will see the different programs that our 10 member universities offer. Um, other tools that are very valuable for, for prospective students are also information in terms of um, uh, like the requirements, uh, language requirements, uh, how your grades translate into uh, the Canadian um, uh, grade system. And if after uh, visiting our website, you still have questions, what I strongly recommend for you to do is to complete this uh, form. It, you will find it as a pop-up on our website where you can provide us with your information and uh, one of our staff will be in contact with you directly to assess your particular, I'm sorry, to respond to your particular inquiry. Okay, well, with this brief introduction, I would like now to introduce you to our main speaker, uh, Rory McEwen, who is the admission advisor at the University of Toronto. Rory, the floor is yours. Now I'm gonna go stop sharing my screen so you can um, share your presentation. Rory, I think your mic is um, off. There we go, my mouse was not cooperating. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to sunny Toronto and my kitchen. Um, I'm going to start sharing my presentation with you, um, but I want to say thank you all for coming out today and for your interest in graduate studies in Canada. Has it transitioned to a slideshow now or are you still seeing basic PowerPoint? No, we see your, your, your PowerPoint now. The slide show? Yeah, the slide, I'm sorry, the slide, yeah. yeah. Great. No, that's perfect, okay. So <laughs> thank you very much for joining us today. As you know, uh, today's information is about graduate studies. Uh, we'll be talking about what programs are available at the master's and PhD level. Uh, the School of Graduate Studies is the umbrella organization that helps 
different graduate units administer their graduate programs. And I use the term graduate unit because we have different kinds of departments and institutes and faculties and centers offering graduate degree programs. So when I use the term graduate unit, it simply means any one of those 87 individual graduate units that are running graduate programs. Um, the School of Graduate Studies provides general advice and support to these units uh, to help make sure that they're offering high quality programs and that they're get attracting the best students. So let's start with a quick overview of uh, today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about Toronto and what it's like to live here. We're gonna talk a little bit about what sets U of T apart from other universities in Canada. And then we'll talk a little bit about programs, application and admission processes. Uh, my name is Rory McEwen and I work at the School of Graduate Studies. Um, my job title is slightly misleading. I'm called the Admissions and International Student Advisor which makes it sound as though I spend a lot of my time advising students. I actually spend most of my time advising the graduate units uh, about international students and uh, I help them with grade equivalencies so they're comparing credentials from country to country, uh, help them identify opportunities for students to apply for external funding, et cetera. But this goes back to 1827 when the University of Toronto was first founded um, and the city of Toronto was very, very different then. Uh, we're currently located effectively in the middle of downtown Toronto, but back then we were uh, built on farmer's fields. Um, the city has grown up around the university campus, and so you do get the feeling of being in many parts of campus as if you're in a rural setting, but somehow there are skyscrapers uh, around you. Uh, Toronto has now become North America's fourth largest city and the largest city in Canada. The city itself has just under 3 million residents and the greater Toronto area, as the region is called, has near a population of nearly 6 million people. Now students get to benefit from this. Um, being in the middle of such an urban setting, they've got theater, opera, concerts, ballet, one of the world's leading film festivals and food from any culture you could care to imagine. It's a very, very diverse city. To give some sense of scope, here's, a, here's downtown Toronto at night. Despite that, um, Toronto has managed to remain one of the world's most livable cities. We consistently score very high on livability scale, uh, whether it's The Economist running it or other, or other agencies. Uh, Toronto's green spaces interlink, uh, creating what's been described as a city in a forest. We've got a really good transit system. Um, so students from other cities are often confused that most of our students don't have cars. Most people living in downtown Toronto wouldn't need one. Uh, Toronto is also an incredibly multicultural city. Um, you can find a cultural community from just about any background you can imagine. And the city government takes this very seriously. They actually provide services, programs, and resources to Torontonians in over 160 languages. There is an on-call translation service for people who need to interact with uh, Toronto City Services, and that service covers 160 languages. The city is also pretty tolerant and open-minded. Uh, we have a very, very low crime rate. In 2017, The Economist ranked the world's major cities for safety, and Toronto placed fourth on that ranking. So safer than Melbourne, Amsterdam, Hong Kong, or Stockholm. We also have a really good economy for young people in particular. If you're considering living in Canada after graduation, Toronto is one of the best places for young people to start their careers. In 2015, The Economist ranked Toronto as one of the world's best for this. It's a strongly diversified economy in the city as the headquarters for all five of Canada's five largest banks and it's the home to a thriving medical science industry alongside arts, environmental design, fashion, film and business services. So that's the city. Let's take a little bit at how U of T ranks against uh, its global competitors. Taking a look strictly by the numbers. Now I will say University rankings are a really useful but very imprecise tool. You can look at a top ranked university and not realize that it doesn't have the program that you're looking for or the programs that it does have aren't a great fit. I regularly redirect students to other universities. Just as an example, Bibiana mentioned if you're interested in a master's degree in communications, 
don't come to U of T. We don't have a master's in communications. So I regularly redirect students to York University or to the University of Ottawa. If you take a look at our position in, in, in world university rankings, uh, there's all sorts of different ranking systems. Uh, but Canada, U of T consistently comes in the top 30, often the top 20 in those different systems. So Times Higher Education ranked as 21st in 2018-19. US News ranked as 20. QS World University Rankings ranked as 28. But let's take a look at some more specific numbers that are actually easier to measure and compare fairly across different universities. Um, our research productivity at U of T is outstanding. It helps that we're partnered with nine fully affiliated hospitals. But if you take a look at the, this information from Clarative Analytics, of all universities in the world, U of T faculty members put out the second greatest number of peer reviewed publications. You can also measure that in citations though. Um, we are cited we are cited more than all but two other universities. So whichever metric you use, measuring the influence of our researchers, uh, this means that U of T students are working with some of the most widely respected researchers in their fields. You're also probably thinking, mm, North America, it's a long way, it's quite an investment. So QS did a, uh, a series of employability rankings in 2019, and U of T was ranked 12th globally out of all universities for employability. It gets even better if you only look at public universities. Looking only at public universities, we were ranked eighth in the world. As I mentioned briefly, we have nine fully affiliated teaching hospitals, which means our medical programs, our rehabilitation science programs, and our health policy programs have all sorts of researchers and opportunities for students to interact with researchers and practitioners in the field. The university is as large and diverse as the city itself. Uh, students will often ask me, which of our three campuses are they going to be, are they going to be studying at? Well, here on the, on the left, you have an aerial view of Mississauga, our Mississauga campus, which as you can see is in the middle of golf courses and parkland. Uh, in, the middle, in the middle picture, the foreground is the University of Toronto. The large prismatic building on the lower left is Robart's uh, research library. You can see the dome of Convocation Hall also on the left, but getting closer to the middle. And basically anywhere that it looks grassy, that's U of T. But on the far right, you'll see that U of T Scarborough is on the edge of a large ravine park. Now, as I said, students will often ask me where they're going to spend most of their time, which campus will they be on? Most of our graduate programs are based out of our St. George campus downtown. We have a growing number of professional master's programs at the University of Toronto Mississauga and at the University of Toronto Scarborough. And we also have a lot of students in programs that are based downtown who still spend a lot of their time out at U of T Scarborough or U of T Mississauga. Why is that? Well, you can be in a graduate program in molecular genetics and your supervisor might have their lab out at U of T Mississauga or U of T Scarborough. So you'd be spending a lot of time in that lab. Or in the humanities and social sciences, our PhD students are teaching assistants and they may find themselves working on a campus that's not their usual home base. So we offer over 280 graduate degree programs across 87 I get mixed up, it's 86 or 87, uh, different graduate units. Um, just as important as the breadth of programs that was our focus on interdisciplinary research, as faculty members and students from separate programs work on projects that cut across all disciplines. As an example of this, Molly Choyche, one of our university professors, uh, is cross-appointed in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry, the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering, the Department of Chemistry, and the Institute of Medical Science. That's because the projects that her students are working on cover off all these different areas and in fact often cover the intersection between those areas. A university is only as good as its professors, but it's also only as good as its students. U of T is Canada's largest graduate school with over 18,000 graduate students, and more than 3,000 of them are international students. But we'd like that proportion to increase. Uh, we think that it's important if we're building a research community to have researchers with all sorts of different backgrounds and perspectives uh, from all over the world. 
So the University of Toronto in all disciplines is actively building research partnerships with universities around the world to collaborate on projects and to share knowledge. And we've got the resources to do that. Uh, we have the third largest library in North America after Harvard and Yale. Uh, last year, we had 19.5 million physical holdings. Uh, so books, journals, maps, reports, and 5.8 million electronic holdings. So usually journal articles held in databases, but sometimes databases themselves uh, of research information. Um, these numbers have gone up. Uh, with COVID-19, we've massively increased our online electronic holdings. Um, but the university library has reopened and in part and is allowing students to order books for pickup. So as a result, our students have access to more and more up-to-date information than they would at any other school in Canada. So let's talk a little bit about the kinds of programs that we offer because they divide into really three main categories. Um, graduate studies are a serious commitment and require a lot of time and energy, time away from family and friends. However, the benefits far outweigh the difficulty. It's an investment in your future for life, and you'll have an opportunity to work with the best in your field of research. Now, one of the ways to do this is with what we'd call a professional master's degree. And for some of these degree programs, they're absolutely essential for a given career. If you want to be a social worker at a higher level, you need to hold a master of social work. If you want to be an architect, you need a degree in architecture. Um, so our master's degree programs are carefully designed, so that's right, carefully designed, uh, to help students advance their career prospects. They usually take one to three years to complete. Master of Architecture is the three-year program. It's, it's the long one. Uh, they're usually course-based. Many of them include an internship or practicum project. And it's important to remember that they're usually not funded. Uh, there will be small entrance scholarships for outstanding students applying to professional programs, but by and large, students are expected to fund these either out of pocket or through loans or through government scholarships from either their home government if they're international or the Canadian government if they're domestic. We also offer master's programs in what we call the research stream or the doctoral stream. Now these programs also take usually about one to three years to complete. They're usually, they're usually supposed to be finished within two, sometimes experiments take longer. And they prepare students to contribute to the world of academic research. I like to describe undergrad as learning to swim, learning to do research and learning, to, learning the basics. I like to think of a master's program as learning to snorkel dive. So you're getting deeper than before, looking at subjects in more depth and closer to, closer to, and preparing yourself for a future as a researcher. Sometimes students are doing this to see if they want to go on to the PhD. Sometimes they simply want expertise in a given field. But they're, they're really, their goal really is to develop your research skills. Master of Science and Master of Applied Science students are usually funded for about, for about two years. In Master of Arts programs, funding is much less common. More and more students fund those out of pocket than, than, than receive funding, but that varies from program to program. One of two key messages you'll need to take away today is that everything varies enormously from program to program. Back in the professional master's program, you can do an eight-month Master of Financial Risk Management. There's almost, there's really not a lot of funding for that. Tuition's quite expensive, but it's a very in-depth, specialized degree. Or you might take two years to do a research-based Master of Science in the Health Sciences, doing one year of coursework and then finishing up your thesis, getting full funding and moving on to a career in medical research. But they look very, very different. Even more different are our doctoral programs. Uh, usually they take four to five years. Um, although some of them are shorter, our doctoral program in law is supposed to take three years. They're usually available only to students who already hold a master's degree, um, although we some, some programs do allow students to have direct admission from undergrad, and almost all doctoral students are funded for three to five years. Um, those that aren't funded really stand out. They're the EDD, the, the Professional Degree in Education, and we're introducing a professional doctorate in nursing that will also not be funded. So bear in mind what I said. Ooh, I forgot 
about collaborative specializations, shame on me. At the graduate level, sorry, there we go. At the graduate level, students used to having double majors in undergrad are sometimes surprised that, nope, you have to pick a program and stick with it. That's true at almost all Canadian graduate programs. But what UFT offers on top of that are what are called collaborative specializations. These aren't degree programs. They're an additional qualification that you earn on top of your degree at the same time and not taking any longer than it would to, to do your degree. Here's an example. We have a collaborative program in addiction studies. Students apply to home degree programs that participate in the collaborative specialization. And those students who do the collaborative specialization will choose as one of their elective courses, the introductory seminar in addiction studies. Now in that seminar, you're going to have students from community health, criminology, information, nursing science, pharmaceutical science, medical, uh, medical science, social work. I didn't have room on the slide for all of them. And so all those students from all those different fields are contributing their perspective into that introductory seminar on addiction studies. Once that's done, they'll do other electives in their home program that match up with the collaborative specialization. If they're doing a thesis, it'll likely be on addiction research. And then they'll finish their degree with both a degree and a certification in the collaborative specialization. So things to remember as you're researching graduate programs. And particularly these things are, are true of U of P. The University of Toronto is very, very, very decentralized. Program details and deadlines are going to vary from department to department. At the moment, I'm getting a lot of questions from dentistry students who are applying to the Master of Science in Dentistry to begin in September 2021. I also have a few programs in education who are still accepting applications for students who want to start in September 2020. So that's, that's a difference of almost 12 months in, in their application deadlines. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the School of Graduate Studies website, it's a really useful resource, but it's only a starting point. It should always point you back in the direction of the graduate unit that's offering the program that you're interested in. And you should really carefully review the information on the graduate unit's program. You'll want to review admission requirements. We'll discuss the general admission requirements in just a minute, but many programs have higher requirements than others and also require standardized tests or specific supporting documents to be submitted. Remember also to start early. Your referees are going to be writing a lot of reference letters, often with deadlines coming at about the same time. You want to give them time to write a good, strong reference letter, and you want to give yourself time to write a good, strong personal statement, curriculum vitae, whatever else it is that the unit wants you to submit as part of your application. You want to take the time to prepare it carefully. Also, admissions decisions are made at the level of the individual graduate units, not at the School of Graduate Studies. So if you have any doubts or questions about your suitability for a program or any details about the application process, you'll want to contact the unit directly. So here are the campus-wide requirements to be admitted to a master's program. Remember that different units may have much more stringent requirements. So you have to have a four-year bachelor's or your country's equivalent. You have to have a mid-B average in your last year of study. And we do provide a tool on the School of Graduate Studies website to compare your country's grading scale to the University of Toronto's grading scale. For students applying to the PhD, they usually have to have a master's degree with a B plus average across the whole master's. And for students seeking direct admission into PhDs from undergrad, there's a mistake on the slide. They have to have an A minus average, but different units define that average differently. Some say an A minus average in senior courses. Some say an A minus average in relevant courses. Some say an A minus average in the final year. So if, you, if you've got an undergraduate degree only and you're looking at direct admission to the PhD, review very carefully what the unit specifies as the requirements. For students whose degrees were earned in non-Anglophone countries, uh, you'll usually have to submit IELTS or TOEFL scores for English language proficiency. The minimum score university-wide for TOEFL is a 93, with writing and speaking scores being no lower than 22. But some units have higher requirements. The Faculty of Information, for instance, requires a minimum overall score of 100. 
We also accept IELTS, and the university-wide minimum is seven, a score of seven overall, with no lower than 6.5 in any one of the four bands. All programs will require reference letters, but some will require different kinds of reference letters. Some programs will ask for one academic and one professional. Some will only want academic. So again, pay close attention as you read the application instructions on the unit's website. Then some units will also want standardized test scores. Computer science recommends that international students should sit, sit the GRE exam and submit scores for it. The Department of Economics actually requires international students to submit those scores. Research programs may very well want you to submit a research proposal that has been well thought out, well prepared, and accurately reflects the state of research in the field. And a lot of science-based programs will also want you to have a supervisor. So the application process begins with you rather than with anything, rather than with any action. You need to confirm that you meet the minimum admission requirements for a program. It's also important to bear in mind that meeting the minimum requirements does not guarantee admission. Uh, admission is competitive. Your chances of admission depend on who else is applying in that year, and there's no way to predict who's going to apply in that year. Three years ago, the Department of Economics found itself in a very strange position. They usually admit 60 MA students, and they went through their applications and they ranked them, and everyone that year who applied pretty much was brilliant. They could have gone down the list to the person, they could have admitted a class twice the size of their usual year. They could have gone down to 120 on that list, and that student would have been as, just as strong as the 60th student in most years. So there's, there is an element of luck. If your program requires a supervisor, reach out early to prospective supervisors. Profs are busy. They may not be able to get back to you very quickly. So make sure that you give any prof you're dealing with, whether it's a prospective supervisor or a referee from your own school, give them plenty of time to give you the help that you need them to offer. The application is done online. Uh, most programs, almost all programs, run through the School of Graduate Studies application site. Some programs, uh, programs in rehabilitation science apply through a province-wide application process, and the Rotman School of Management runs its own application process for its master's students. There's an application fee with every application. It's $125 starting in September. Uh, and this application fee is non-transferable and non-refundable. So if you start an application and pay the fee, then realize you're not a good fit for the program, you're out of luck. So really do make sure you know that the program's a good fit for you before you, before you commit by paying the application fee. The other thing to do is to apply not just on time, but early. Give yourself plenty of time to pull the materials together. You don't want an internet outage at 11.58 p.m. the night of the application deadline. If you're finding a supervisor, um, there are a few things to bear in mind. It can often take a long time to find a supervisor, and you're going to spend a long time working with them. They are your, the most important person to you at the university. So, I strongly suggest that in any program that has supervisors, whether or not you need to have a supervisor at time of admission, it's really good to be in touch with profs you think you'd like to work with. Also, research matters. Um, check faculty biographies online, read professors' publications, see what kind of work they're doing. Make sure you understand your program's process for assigning a supervisor. I'll give an example. In English, students are admitted and do a year's worth of coursework before committing to a supervisor and to a supervisory committee. They often use that coursework as a chance to meet different supervisors and get to know their different working styles. Some departments in medical science do rotations. Students move through three different labs and at the end of it are asked to choose one or in, in conjunction with the supervisor in that lab. And some simply expect you to have reached out to the supervisor on your own before applying. And if you apply without a supervisor, your chances of admission are very slight. So just to give an example, I've got a screenshot here from the website of the Department of Molecular Genetics. Um, and the example I like to use is Charles Boone there on the lower left-hand side. So if you click on his link, it'll take you to a department formatted page. 
shows you what his research is, Functional Genomics for Mapping Genetic, Chemical Genetic, and Protein-Protein Interactions in Yeast. Great. Uh, they give a very clear description of the kind of people that they want or the kind of research that they're doing. They're developing and applying functional genomic approaches for mapping genetic, blah, 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 on a large scale using a yeast model system. So they're looking for students with a strong background in biology and in computer science. Interesting. And since molecular genetics does rotations, at the bottom, highlighted there in yellow, it indicates that the Boom Lab is taking rotation students. If you go to Professor Boone's own website, and there's a, there's, a, there's a link on this site next to his photograph, uh, the link to his website, which provides even more information. And it also gives you a sense of the atmosphere in the lab or the tone of the lab. And look at what the, the description is here. This is, much more, this is much more focused. We are looking for talented graduate students and postdocs interested in computational analysis of yeast functional genomics data. A strong background in computational biology is desired. Exceptional interest in understanding yeast biology and a great sense of teamwork are essential. That's really specific. Someone who's just applying to molecular genetics saying, hey, where will I go? I don't know. They're not a great fit for that lab based on that description. So let's talk a little bit about funding. As I mentioned earlier, professional programs like the Master of Engineering, um, Master of Business Administration are usually not funded. So you want to explore other options such as government scholarships, loans, or, 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 or other resources. Many students actually find it's worthwhile to take a little bit of time off between undergraduate and graduate study to pay off some undergrad debt, maybe rack up some savings, get some work experience. I think it's a great idea. I'm a big fan of that year or two off. But if you're doing that, I have one really important recommendation. And that is before you take the time off, arrange for, have, arrange for your references. Talk with referees and have them do a draft of the reference letter so that when you come back in a year or two's time, they know who you are, they've got the details down, they don't have to rack their memory for memories of years ago when you were in their class. Make sure you get those references nailed down if you want to take time off. MA programs may or may not be funded, so you want to check the department website carefully. As an example, English has opted not to fund its, its master's students, whereas the Graduate Center for Study of Drama has decided to provide them with partial funding. Master of Science and Master of Applied Science programs are usually funded. Uh, students earn a stipend as a research assistant plus a direct grant scholarship, which would cover the costs of tuition plus at least $15,000. Students are still expected to apply for external funds. So if you're eligible for a government scholarship from your home government, your department may put in their offer letter that it's conditional that you apply. The PhD programs and the SJD program are usually funded. And again, it's usually a stipend as a research assistant or salary as a teaching assistant plus direct grant scholarship to cover costs, and it's usually tuition plus at least $15,000. And again, students are still expected to apply for outside funds. These funding packages are time limited. Uh, the SJD is funded for three years. Most PhD programs are funded for four, and a few are funded for five. You want to work hard to make sure that you finish your degree within that window of funding. You end up not coming to U of T as a degree-seeking student, we still have a lot of students interested in coming for short-term visits or for joint degrees. Visiting research students, we have what's known as the International Visiting Graduate Student Program. It's open to any international graduate student who's interested in conducting research at the University of Toronto. You don't have to be at a school that we have an exchange agreement with, any recognized university, anywhere in the world, as long as you're in a graduate program. You must be enrolled in a degree program at your home institution, so no diploma programs, no recent graduates, no undergrads. And students then end up paying incidental fees, but not tuition at the University of Toronto for full access to all research and recreation facilities. Uh, the fees for any given session are usually around $800, plus students also pay health insurance premiums that I have just been told will be $60 a month starting in September. And this is 
Fabio, who is one of our visiting students from Brazil. He's uh, actually finished his PhD now. I heard from him the other month. He's, he's done his PhD and is now Dr. Sacarnero Shepanik. So U of T research and, and, and work that he did at U of T was an essential part of his thesis for a degree at his home institution. In some cases, we also do what's known as a joint educational placement. Uh, this is where there's a partnership, either an existing partnership or a developing partnership between researchers at uh, two universities, one being UFT, uh, who want to co-supervise a PhD student or PhD students. Uh, students enroll in one institution as the lead institution and one institution at the collaborator institution. And then a single degree is granted at the end by the lead institution. There's that information. Additional requirement to this, though, students have to meet the admission requirements for both institutions. And where U of T is the lead, the parchment and transcript will indicate the degree has been awarded as a single degree under a joint placement arrangement with, and then the name of the partner institution. You may be wondering what student life is like at U of T. It is a very heavily research intensive university. Um, but here's a secret. Uh, the downtown campus, St. George campus, in any given year will graduate more students from second entry programs like law, medicine, and pharmacy and graduate study than it does undergrads. You're a big group out there. Um, we have almost 900 campus clubs. We have a residence that's devoted entirely to graduate and second entry students. And we have ever increasing athletic facilities. Uh, U of T was host for the Pan Am Games a few years ago. So our Scarborough campus picked up an Olympic swimming center and a few other things. Uh, we also provide academic support for our graduate students, partly through the Graduate Center for Academic Communication, which is part of the School of Graduate Studies. Uh, we have three full-time faculty members and many, many part-time specialized instructors who teach courses like how to develop grant proposals, um, how to become a better editor of your own work, how to turn a seminar paper into a journal article, many, many, many topics. And they're very, very successful uh, in what they do. Students who go to their grant application workshops are statistically significantly more likely to have successful grant applications. They also teach academic conversation for a new student who arrived from overseas. And they have an excellent set of courses and workshops on oral presentation skills so that if you're not comfortable as a public speaker, you can develop those skills and be more comfortable standing up in front of a class as a TA or giving a conference paper. The Graduate Professional Skills Program uh, runs programs and workshops for students in four key areas. Research competency. As I said, we have North America's third largest library, so students appreciate a little bit of help learning to navigate it at the start. Teaching. In the humanities and social sciences, a lot of graduate students are teaching assistants. And if you've never taught before, uh, it's good for both you and your students uh, to enroll in the teaching assistant training program, which is several days of pedagogical training. Communication skills, so the oral presentation skills workshop, a workshop on negotiation. And there are also workshops on personal effectiveness uh, and sort of personal management and effectiveness. There is a two day mini, sorry, mini project management certificate and a few other things. A lot of my colleagues will say that these programs are free. I never say that. I say that you don't pay individually for these programs. These programs are funded out of your tuition fees. So if you do come to U of T and if you're paying those fees, make sure to make use of these programs. Otherwise your fees are being used by someone else. Finally, we also provide health services, career education and exploration, and specialized services for international students. We have international transition advisors who help students settle in in the first months of their time at U of T. We have licensed immigration advisors who can advise you on study permit application or on uh, any hiccups you might run into in the visa or permit application process. Uh, we do want to have more international students here, and we do want to provide them with the support that they need one day we'll see them walk across the stage at Convocation Hall to earn a U of T degree. So let's go to the question and answer session.
Thank you very much, Rory, for your excellent presentation. We're now going to move into the quest, question and answer set, um, portion of the webinar. Please note that due to time, we may not be able to answer all the questions. If this happens, we're going to send the remaining questions to Rory, so his department is able to address them at a later time. Right, so to continue, um, I will ask you the, the, the first question. So Gala would like to know if it's possible for an international medical graduate to study a medical specialty or fellowship at EFT. And the second part of her question is, where should she apply to a, mas to a master's at the Faculty of Medicine or at the Health Science Faculty? So two answers to that. The exactly. first is a medical specialty or fellowship is not a degree. Is not a degree. So if you're doing a residency or a clinical fellowship that's offered through the Faculty of Medicine and the Department of what's known as Postgraduate Medical Education. If you Google PGME, Postgraduate Medical Education, and Toronto, you'll find the resources for specialties and fellowships. In terms of doing a master's in, in medical science, we have many different departments in the Faculty of Medicine. So I don't recommend that students choose their program going department by department if it's, a, if it's a graduate degree program in the medical sciences. Instead, I recommend going supervisor by supervisor. So Google your research interests, plus the phrase University of Toronto, and then look up the different faculty members that are working on your specialization and look at what kind of experiments and publications they have. So if you want to work on genetic approaches to treating, to treating cancer, you might find a supervisor in the Institute of Medical Science. You might find a supervisor in molecular genetics. You might find a supervisor in pharmaceutical sciences. So you'd need to, you'd need to really search by supervisor. Next question. Thank you, Rory. Uh, yes, the next question is, um, is housing on campus guarantee for master students applicants? No, no, we don't provide a, we don't provide a housing guarantee for graduate students. Graduate House has several hundred spaces, but there's always a waiting list. Uh, a number of the theological colleges don't have enough of their own students and open their rooms up to graduate students. And we also provide online resources for apartment hunting off campus, but there's no guarantee per se. Thank you, Rory. The next question is um, in terms of the testing, uh, language testing that the applicants would like to do. Now that, you know, with due to COVID, many test centers have been closed. So the question is, do you, does the University of Toronto accept Duolingo? And if not, uh, what are the alternatives to present the testing portion of, for, for the language requirements? So we do not accept Duolingo, except from Iranian students as in students living in Iran at present. In every other jurisdiction in the world, sorry, I, wait a minute, no, yeah, we do accept Iranian and students living in mainland China. Uh, in every other country in the world, ETS has been able to set up an at-home version of the TOEFL IBT that meets our security requirements. So in, in places where that's available, no, we will not accept Duolingo. Thank you, Rory. So the next question is from Luis Gomez. Uh, so Luis has studied a master's in the UK, and he would like to know if there's a chance to waive the English requirement, um, or, or if that depends on each department's uh, policies. The department, so it depends on which degree you apply to. One of the rules we have is a little strange. Your admitting degree has to have been taken in English. So if you're applying to a PhD with a degree from the UK, then usually the department you're applying to will waive the requirement for English language proficiency scores. Some departments, a very small number, don't like offering that waiver, so check. If you're applying to a master's degree though, your admitting degree is the bachelor's degree. And uh, that would not qualify you for the exemption. It's a strange rule, but there you are. Thank you, Rory. So the next question is about uh, postdoctoral opportunities at EFT. Could you provide some information where our students or audience can, can find information in terms of a postdocs at EFT where they can, yeah, do one? Sure, um, there is some information on the School of Graduate Studies website, but what it's really gonna do is direct you back out. Opportunities for postdoctoral student, uh, for postdoctoral researchers look very, very different in the humanities and social sciences on one side, 
and the sciences on the other. Uh, in the sciences, a primary invest principal investigator may have room in their budget to hire a postdoctoral researcher to work on a project. Those opportunities will usually be advertised on the, the, the PI's website and possibly on the website of their home department. Um, those ones you, re you just really have to dig and find. A significant number of postdocs, though, don't get their position this way. Instead, they apply for funding from a government source, usually in their home country, uh, to do postdoctoral research. Those postdocs come in, find a supervisor and say, hello, I've got some funding here, I'd like to work on a project. And this is allowed as long as the student's funding, plus any contributions from the supervisor, amount to more than $35,350 per year. If you're coming for only six months for a project, it would be half that. If you're here for two years, you'd need to have twice that much in funding. Thank you, Rory. Um, the next question, is it possible to apply for two programs at the same time? It is possible to apply for two programs at the same time. Um, the application system will only show a department their applications, but if you're given offers in both, you can only accept one. Thank you, Rory. So the next question um, is interesting. So uh, this is a, stu is a, a student, well, a, a bit, maybe a graduate, is if I study a PhD in Mexico in computer science and completed it, may I pursue another PhD in computer science at EFT as my second PhD? So it's basically a second PhD in the same field. So okay. we changed the rules a few years ago to say, yes, you can, but I'm not sure why you would. Uh, a second PhD is a lot of a time commitment, and I'm not sure how much value added it is to have a second doctorate. Thank you, Rory. So the next question is also in terms of exam. So due to COVID pandemic, the requirement for GRE scores will be, uh, with, I guess, will, will still be required, or there's some flexibility on, on that? So that's decided at the level of the individual graduate units. SGS does not require GRE scores, but some programs do. We've encouraged programs to be flexible. Um, I know that a few of them accepted some expired GRE scores. Um, some have not been as flexible, so you really have to contact the department you're looking at applying to. Thank you, Rory. The next question from Andres Castillo. Um, he's wondering if he could contact more than one prospective su supervisor, even if the professors work at the same uh, department, but they have different research topics. I usually suggest to students that they should develop a ranked list of who they think they'd most like to work with. Start with your preferred choice. Uh, and if you don't get an answer a week later, send a quick follow up. And if a few days later you haven't heard, move on to choice number two. They do talk to each other and uh, they might feel a little confused that you're wooing two separate supervisors in the same department. Thank you, Rory. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind our audience that on July 30th, we're gonna host a webinar on how to contact a supervisor. And we're going to have uh, guests from our member universities where they will give you tips and tricks in terms of how to prepare an outstanding um, uh, application for graduate studies. So please stay tuned for that, for that webinar. So after this commercial, <laughs> Rory, I will move on to the next question. Sure. And that would be, um, so what is the best way to stand out as an applicant for a PhD program? Is it taking extra online courses, publishing, or is there something that you could recommend our audience on, um, to note in their application? So as a rule, I'd say if something sounds like it would make you stand out as a better applicant, it probably will. So yeah, publications are great. Make sure that they're in respectable peer-reviewed journals. Extra courses in your field, sure, won't hurt, no problem, do well in them. Um, the thing that I would say that most students don't quite get when applying to a research program is the importance of the research proposal. A proposal can be a bad proposal because it's covering a topic that's not really relevant or is already well researched or just isn't worth the time and energy. Or it can fail because the students taking on too much. It's too big a question. There's no way they're going to finish it in the time appropriate. 
or with the resources that are available to them at the university they're applying to. In the middle is the sweet spot. So you develop a proposal that shows you really understand the state of research in your field. You know that the question, research question you're trying to answer is important and hasn't been answered yet. And you can demonstrate that your background and the university's resources are a good fit for trying to answer that question. So just as an example to show off a little bit, um, many universities don't, ev don't have genetic sequencing machines that students have access to. We not only have genetic sequencing machines that student have, students have access to, we have gene editing machines that students have access to. So whenever you're considering a particular research project or proposal, make sure that the university you're applying to has the resources that you need. Thank you very much, Rory. Um, so we'll ask two more questions. Um, so the next question will be, could you explain the difference um, in terms of the masters that are offered at EFT that are co coursework and the ones that are, uh, I'm sorry, coursework plus research project and coursework plus research thesis. So they would like to know what's the main difference between the two. It's really not a big difference. Um, so I'm trying to think of a department that does this. Um, there are regulations that apply to a thesis that don't apply to a major project. So some departments, in order to have a bit more flexibility on what they can approve for their students to do, have decided to stick only with research projects. Thank you, Rory. So the next question, and before I ask the last question, I just would like to remind our audience, because I see a number of questions um, of information that were presented. So we were going to be sending you the recording of, of this webinar, so you can revisit the information that were explained earlier, and you may find the answer to your questions. Alternatively, please feel free to connect with us. Right now on your screen, you're seeing our contact information, and please send us an email or fill our, our uh, form that is on our website and we'll be able to answer your questions individually if you just send us an email. So Rory, the last question, can you uh, explain a little more or tell us more about uh, the cost of living in Toronto, uh, advantages of staying in you know, the big city and all of that for our audience? Sure, um, not gonna lie, Toronto is a fairly expensive city to live in. Um, the most expensive thing I would say is rent or a place to live. Um, I'm not gonna turn my laptop around and show you my cluttered apartment because working from home is difficult. I live in a 30 square meter uh, studio apartment with a really nice view of downtown and a large balcony. And that costs me 1100 Canadian dollars a month. So that, that should give you some perspective on, on, on how high rental costs can be. A lot of our graduate students opt to share either with a spouse or partner or with friends. And we actually have a roommate matching service uh, on the housing office's website. Beyond that, you'll pay more the closer to downtown you want to live, but the closer to downtown you live, the less you spend on transportation. Uh, last time I checked, a Metro pass that gets you on buses, streetcars, and subways was about $130. So, I could live in a slightly uh, less convenient apartment and pay less rent and make up for it with that Metro Pass. Um, depending on how good a cook you are, food isn't actually all that expensive. Um, and there's a lot of very good alternative options for inexpensive restaurant food. We run the absolute gamut from Super cheap, you can eat a meal under $5, all the way to Michelin star restaurants. Um, not sure how else to quantify that. There used to be a guide on the website for the Center for International Experience that gave estimates, but they took it down because they found that there was just too much variety between students and, and their ability to plan and budget. Thank you, Rory. And also, uh, I would like to remind our audience that when you think about completing graduate students internationally, you will need to, you know, make some adjustments to your to your lifestyle that that will greatly help in terms of budgeting, and um, and definitely uh, like do some research in advance so you can obviously plan in advance in terms of your budget. Uh, before we close, I would like just to take two minutes and request our audience that when we finish the webinar, if you can take two minutes to answer a very, very brief survey 
in terms of the content of the webinar because we would like to provide you with more uh, webinars that with information that you need and that you're requiring. And also, Rory, would you like to add anything else? Um, feel free to email if you have any unanswered questions with a couple of exceptions. I've seen a number of questions in the, the, the question feed that are very department specific. If that's the case, you want to contact the graduate unit directly, not me or the School of Graduate Studies. Thank you very much, Rory. And um, yeah, we will be sending the, the, the questions that we're not able to answer, that we were not able to answer due to time um, to the to University of Toronto. And, but as, as Rory mentioned, please feel free to reach out to the department directly as well. Well, with this, we close the, the, the webinar for today and we hope to see you next week. Our next webinar uh, will be the University of Waterloo. Thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Take care, everyone.